Okay, so today we'll see how far we get into this, but we're going to cover the topic of web apps, plugins, scripts, and APIs. A lot of good stuff here. Okay, we'll start with web apps. So, everybody knows you go to YouTube, you watch some videos, basically your browser functions as the video player. Uh, so, if you go to YouTube, right, the first thing you see is a bunch of links to videos. You go to YouTube. That's what we get. We get a bunch of stuff, right? Basically, random baseline stuff. Always a little bit different. Okay? But whatever it is, that's what we see. Now, if you click on one of those, that takes you, of course, to a page where that video plays. And again, this is something we should all be familiar with. Let's see. All right. Ooh, match chain reaction. Sure, why not? Let's see what happens. So we go here, right, and we play, and we got 15 seconds. Oh, there's an ad. Let's see how long the other thing is. Ooh, scientific purposes only. Well, let's just watch the fire happen. All right, there we go. Do not try this at home. Yeah. Oh, shit. It's going to go. Fail. All right. Anyway. So we know how that works, right? Basically, there's a video, it plays, it plays in your web browser, does all, web browser does all the stuff. So, in essence, your browser acts like a video player application for each page. Well, this was not always true, right? 20 years ago, 15 years ago, if you wanted to watch something, you had to get a whole separate application to do it. Nowadays, it all goes through the web browser. So, let's talk. What are some issues? Well, number one, Different hardware configurations. How does YouTube manage to show the same video successfully to everybody, regardless of what hardware you're using, right? Whether you're using it on a smartphone or a laptop with one graphics card or a desktop with a different graphics card, whatever. Uh, different operating systems, different browsers, and different versions of the same browser, right? There's a lot of variability that has to be accounted for there. <coughs> so, once upon a time, YouTube stored the data for the video, but you needed a separate video app, video player application like Flash Player to actually watch the videos. Now, the videos are separate HTML objects. You don't need a separate video player. So, the question's here. How did this happen? What technologies were required? And perhaps most importantly, why did it happen? All right. Well, to get to this, right, to unravel this great mystery, we're going to start with the basics. Basics of what is a web app. Well, web app is fundamentally a client server application that runs within a browser window. Okay, so anytime you're doing something in your browser and it's running in the browser window, like watching this, that's a web app of sorts, right? If I go, if I try to find uh, play Angry Birds online, right? That's a web app. There's an application. It runs in the uh, do, 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 water detected spin drive. This is insane. Sure. Okay, this is a web application. I go to the site and play some Angry Birds. It happens. It doesn't matter what machine I have, right? I can do it on this one, I do it on a different one, whatever. Kaboom, it goes down. Okay. So, also, typically runs online, but potentially also offline. So a lot of these web apps, they require connections. Okay, so if, for example, I say, okay, here I have, I have all the data I need to play, I'm going to shut down my wireless connection for a minute. So let's disconnect. Do I have wireless? I do not. Okay, I have just this. I have the little dot here. I got nothing. Can I still play? Yeah, of course I can still play, right? Because what you wouldn't want, you wouldn't want for every pixel of motion within your game to require a network connection. Then everything would be really slow. So... Some of this, you defer to the browser. The browser stores the information that it needs to play this again. But if I want to, uh, let's see if it might need a network. Nope, it doesn't even need that. So it stores the complete level 
locally on my machine. I don't need the network connection to deal with that. Okay? But if I want to go to a different level, then I have to load some different stuff. Let's go on. It's going to want to pull something. Oh, no, I even get this one. Okay. Whee! Terrible. Okay. Anyway, you get the idea. I'm going to put my wireless back on. I wasn't sure about that. I'd never done the uh, next level stuff. Okay. So, web app is a client server application, right? So, for example, if I'm doing Angry Birds, I'm the client. Some server out there has all the information about levels and whatnot. It pulls that, delivers it to my web browser so I can play the game. And the game runs within a browser window. And again, typically runs online. Most of the, I mean, I certainly need to have an internet connection to be able to get to the server in the first place to get that. But it loads up a bunch of data, you know, so I can play at least a few levels before I need to connect to the server again. So, implications of all this. Number one. There's an assumption that your storage uh, capacity will be limited, your computer pa computing power will be limited. So typically, when you're talking about web apps, you're talking about thin apps for thin clients. What's a thin app? We talked about that some time ago. What's a what's that? Yeah, basically. So a thin app means you know on the client machine you basically have an interface and not much more and the real work of the application happens on another machine and gets delivered to you over some kind of network connection so yeah so thin client is basically the real application runs on another device not on your device okay what's a thin client yeah that's the idea right it's kind of a weak machine, right? The ultimate is kind of a, a dumb terminal that all it does is uh, accept the user input but doesn't actually do any processing itself. But there are degrees of thinness. So a thin client is basically thinking a weak machine that's not really capable of running the application well. Okay, so that's typically web apps are designed with that in mind, right? So for example, if you want, uh, you could view Facebook as a collection of web apps Right? They're basically all thin apps. Almost all the work is happening on Facebook's side, not on your machine. And the assumption is most of the clients are going to be thin. They're going to be smartphones that, yeah, they can do some stuff, but they're not super powerful like a current, you know, current grade of desktop. So web apps will also expect different hardware, right? Dif desktops, tablets, smartphones, any of those could access the Internet. If a device can see the page, they can access that web app. And the web app has to be designed to handle that sort of uh, hardware difference. Likewise, different operating systems, different browsers. You wouldn't want to write a, write a web app that, say, only runs for Mac OS or that only runs on Windows. And you certainly wouldn't want to write one that's only compatible with one particular web browser because then you instantly lose, you know, half or more of your audience. Last, web apps should tolerate disconnects and traffic surges, right? What you certainly don't want to have happen is that you're connected to some web app and you're using your mobile device to do it, and you hit a patch where there's a bad connection, and you're temporarily disconnected, and then you have to go in through the whole sign-in and verification process every time something like that happens. It'd be a big headache. So web apps are typically designed to say, well, if somebody's not sending me any information right now, I'm going to have a very, very, very long time before I consider that uh, connection to be fully timed out. Okay? So those are key attributes of web apps. Now, Although web pages and web apps are closely related, they're not quite the same. So, both of them are content displayed in browsers, right? Typically retrieved from servers to, you know, be displayed on your machine uh, over an internet connection. Now, web page or website can exist to run one or more web apps, like Facebook, right? Facebook obviously has a whole bunch of different applications that it runs. Even if you're just going the basic vanilla Facebook uh, without any add-ins at all, you still have instant messenger, well, I think that's an add-in now, too, isn't it? Uh, you have to opt into that. But, you know, there are a lot of things built into Facebook that you can do. Certainly wall posting and uh, photo upload, stuff like that, are uh, apps that are pretty much inherent to Facebook. But here's the difference. So, web page holds the content, might not be dynamic. For example, you can find a purely uh, static text page. So let me see if I can find this old thing. There was one that was this uh, rant from a complete lunatic back in the day. Let's see if I can find it. And it, ended, it, it was something, it was like a total paranoid uh, dude. 
And so he had this idea that telepaths, right, people that can transmit thoughts and read people's minds, were so dangerous that they had to be killed. And so the whole thing was repeated over and over in capital letters. So it's okay to kill a telepath. Let's see if I can find that. It was all text. Hmm. Seems to be a popular text. Hmm. No? Nope. All right. I don't know. Anyway, but the thing back in the day that I remember from it, it was a, uh, let's see if I can do a complete perfect search if I can get it. Oh. What's that? No. Anyway, all right, so nothing there. You can find some old all text pages, right? Some shitty kind of uh, angel fire uh, pages or something. Let's uh, random angel fire page. Anybody ever heard of angel fire? No. This is from this is how old it was. Back from 2012, there's a link Angel Fire pages that were still up right now. It was a popular, you know, template for hosting and designing websites. So it was back in one day. Ooh. Here's one. Mark Zuckerberg's embarrassing childhood Angel Fire website. They look like this. Ooh, that's freaky. Go away. Okay. Ah. How do I get away from that panel? Fuck. All right, there we go. Okay, so this was what they looked like, right? Static on. Here's an eyeball. Hello and welcome to my page. The only site where a yellow eye blinks at you. And some random cowabunji monkey theory. Magnetic poet. I don't know. This is what Mark Zuckerberg was doing, okay? Circa 1999 as he was 15. Okay, but a bunch of static content, right? There's nothing dynamic there. There's just some links. There's an image. No video that plays. No uh, JavaScript running on it. Nothing like that. Okay, so web page holds content, might not be dynamic, could all be text and stab it, static images. Web app, though, inherently, it's an application. It's going to let you do something, right? Might not be something particularly uh, important, like it might just be to play Angry Birds, but it's going to let you do something, okay? And because it's going to do something, it needs some kind of dynamic content. Also, web page is basically a container that might or might not hold web apps. So, Web page might contain one, multiple, or no web applications, right? So in the case of one, I go to that Angry Birds site, I play some Angry Birds. Yeah, that's it's running one web app there. Facebook, I go to Facebook.com, it's running a whole bunch of web apps there. Or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's early Angel Fire page running no web applications. Okay. So, plug-in content, plugins and scripts. So, web application has to exist somewhere, either on your own local machine or on a remote server, right? The application has to be, again, either on your machine or another machine, it's somewhere. So, with that basic model, right, it runs on your machine or it runs somewhere else, there's two basic methods for running apps in web browsers. Number one, number one is the plugin, right? And the plugin, let me try this again, you can see it a little better. In the plugin model, you download and install the application on your machine, then you run it. So a plugin is a separate application, runs along with your web browser, again, like Flash Player. The other one is a script, right? So a script, you embed instructions in the page HTML that retrieve the dynamic content when you need it. Okay, so just, uh, okay, that's fine, that's fine for now. Plugins are the older model, just FYI. They're, they're not quite gone away entirely, but for the last, I don't know, three years or so, they've kind of been gone away. Uh, it used to be that they were practically a default option, and a lot of the big websites used them, like YouTube used to use Flash Player for plugins, but they had some security problems, and so the good people that manage HTML released a new version of HTML that, for a lot of purposes, made plugins unnecessary. Scripts, though, scripts, we still see those all the time. Uh, scripts are a very popular thing. We'll get a little bit of, on both of these before it's all over. Okay. So, way back when, circa 1995 or something, uh, web browsers only supported static content, like text or unchanging images, right? This is your basic, you know, 1994 page, like uh, your Amazon, okay? Do an image. Amazon 1994 page, right? It looked like this, and we've seen this before in this class, but uh, 
We'll blow up that image a little bit. Okay, that's what it looks like. It was static content. There's an image, there's some text, there's some links, but there's no animations. If Even if there was an animation in 1995, it would be some shitty GIF image. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But, god damn these big ads. I am not a fan. Not a fan of your big ads. Okay. And this thing. No wonder newspapers are going broke. Okay. So, uh, there's all static content there, right? Nothing's really happening, no scripts. It just didn't exist back then. And there wasn't a plug-in. There wasn't anything to do here either because the site is so simple. So way back then, sites were simple. You couldn't do much on them. And that was okay because the Internet itself was still pretty new and exciting. But eventually, people wanted dynamic content like real-time updates and browser games, right? So you could do stuff. One of the early ones, chess.com. So chess.com ran a specific type of plugin called an applet. Okay, so plugins in general, separate applications help a browser display additional content types, typically dynamic content. Uh, the big one about 20 years ago was what was called the applet. So with an applet, you downloaded a Java application that ran in some kind of box on your web page. So basically, within the HTML of your page, you know, you'd have some uh, applet tag. It wasn't actually an applet tag. And source equals, you know, my program dot Java, some source code there. And then, you know, click to start, whatever. Nah. Something like this. You'd have a, a designated uh, thing, and you could also have like a height and width. Height equals 400, width equals 800. Right, so you could have pixel sizes. You'd basically designate a rectangle in your browser, and the applet would run there with whatever you specified as the program source. Okay, so it was this kind of HTML structure. Not exactly this, but, you know, to give you the idea, you had a tag for an applet. Okay. Now, nobody uses applets anymore. They're dead. They've been dead for about 10 years. Uh, many years ago, when I first started learning Java, I uh, took a course here where we did do a little applet that, uh, I don't know, pulled stock prices from a database or something. Uh, so they were using them for a while, but they, they faded away. So here's the, the key things. So an applet downloaded Java application that runs in a designated box on a web page. Java is a uh, universal uh, language. It basically, it can run on any machine. So you develop something called a, uh, a Java virtual machine that basically does this. I'm going to say why. Whoop. Why Java can run on any machine. Okay. So essentially, most languages, so here's, uh, here's the C++ model. If you've ever heard of C++, yeah, uh, common for video games. Okay, so here's something to think about. You go to the store and you want to buy, I don't know, the new whatever that's just come out. And there's going to be different versions of it, right? There's going to be one version for Windows, be another version for Mac, right? It's not written in Java. Java is a universal language. It's written in something that, you know, is uh, native for a particular, uh, particular hardware configuration. So with C++, basically, the source code itself has to uh, learn and specify the exact memory locations for things like graphics cards. And those can be different for different operating systems, okay? Or hardware configurations. Okay? So, basically the programmers have to uh, rewrite much of the code to be optimized for particular machines. Okay, with Java, you get something called a Java virtual machine. So essentially, uh, with Java, uh, there's a standard, basically like an API, uh, a standard interface called the Java virtual machine, which needs to be installed prior to running any Java applications. What is it? Well, 
a mapping of your current hardware configuration to a standard set of, I don't know, basically uh, Java terms. So when Java wants to draw an image on your screen, instead of directly looking up the graphics card memory addresses, it consults the Java virtual machine and sends the instruction and the JVM uh, draws the image wherever appropriate for that machine. Okay, so basically you have this translation. With C++, you generally don't have much in the way of translation between the application and your hardware configuration, right? There's a few standard sets. There's like, you know, your 100% PC compatible or your basic Apple machines. They're going to be different. Java, Java says, don't care what kind of hardware you use. We have this thing called a Java virtual machine, which is basically, you know, a long list of all the memory addresses for all of the things that Java might need to do. So it can say stuff like, if I want to draw stuff to the graphics card, here's where the graphics card is located and how much memory it has and what I can do, stuff like that. So that'll all be included in the Java virtual machine. So the source code itself doesn't need to know any of the, uh, you know, the hardware details of the machine. The source code can just say, I'm going to pass this to the Java virtual machine. The Java virtual machine knows where the graphics card is. Okay, that's how Java uh, becomes a universal language. I'm not really going to ask you about that, but that's just information. Okay, so Java can run on any machine. Problems with applets, two things. Number one, weak aesthetics, which is a fancy way of saying they kind of look shitty. And second, security vulnerabilities. So let's talk about the aesthetics. Basic problem, have I done my uh, fractional pixels thing in here yet? You're like, fractional pixels, what the hell is that? Okay, so if I draw something in a big font in black, let's make this big, 48, so... Uh, what shall we write? My dog has fleas. Okay. He doesn't. No matter what you've heard. Okay, if I zoom in, if you look real close at this, you can see... Oh, man. Let's see. I'm going to scroll over here. I don't know why the scrolling there isn't working. Hmm. That's weird. There we go. Okay, so if I'm zooming in here, if you look really close, like if you actually like walked up and looked at my machine, maybe you can see it from where you are. You see on the left, there's a little bit of brown, and on the right, there's a little bit of blue. Is that visible to you guys if you look real close? Yeah, that's fractional pixels. The idea is, even though you zoom in really close, it can do stuff like that to make it look a little fuzzy and fool human eyes and the graphics look better when you change the size of what's going on, okay? On the other hand, if I just do it, we're going to do it this way. I'm going to write something, and it's going to look crappy, but that's okay. I'm going to do their heavy line. I'll say, my dog hates your dog. It's true, my dog does hate all other dogs. I don't, I don't know what his problem is. Okay, so if I zoom in on that, you can see on mine, it's starting to look, the technical term is pixelicious. Okay, you can see very clearly here that, you know, it's all kind of jaggedy looking, right? It, this is much smoother. Everybody see that? That's what I mean when I talk about fractional pixels. So. Java applets, because they were written in Java and because Java is a universal language, it tends to reduce the graphics to the lowest available setting of any machine, right? You don't want to write a Java application that's going to fail to run on some machine because the graphics requirements are too high. So the graphics, you know, tend to look kind of crappy like this. They tend to use exact pixels instead of fractional pixels. So 
They didn't look that good. Now that was fine if you had like a simple app and it was basically black and white and it was all in one standard size. For example, you have the chess.com input, right? Chess is not a, uh, a very high quality whatever. So if we have, where's my the pre-app era? It's probably, it looks something like this, okay? And again, you know, your chess thing is gonna be running in a standard size window on your screen and the graphics, they're fine, you know, for a chess game, it doesn't have to be super dynamic. So it was okay for stuff. And in the 90s, we were happy to have that. But you start doing more advanced stuff, you don't want, you know, Angry Birds to be like precise, you know, pixels, the fractional pixels just look a lot better. And other stuff like watching videos, same kind of thing, right? You might change the video to have different resolution or run it on different size devices. You don't necessarily want to be locked into a single screen size. So the applets did not look very good. That's the key takeaway. The other thing, security vulnerabilities. Well, the basic problem with plugins is that they need to have access to some other data on your machine in order to do your job, their job. For example, suppose you're playing some Facebook game and it wants to keep track of your high scores on Facebook's network. Well, in order to do that, it basically has to have access to your session keys, the credentials that you use to stay logged into Facebook. So the app is gonna say, well, I'm a legitimate app, I'm on Facebook, I need access to your session keys, I'm gonna use that to you know, contact this other part of the site and you, you know, verify that, you know, and say the uh, high score that I'm just entering is actually yours. I'm gonna use your session key. And that's a legitimate usage of that. But apps can be written to be malicious, to try to lift your session keys and do other stuff with them. For example, to uh, you know, spam all of your friends with various uh, bogus advertisements. Uh, the other thing, let's see. With Java, because Java is a universal language, the app, right, the applet is going to run on any machine. Well, if you find a security vulnerability in Java, guess what? You suddenly have access to literally every machine running this, right? If you design different versions, some in different languages or for different operating systems, even if you find a vulnerability, it's not going to affect all of them. But if you get one for Java, it will. So that was a big problem. Okay. So the next thing that came along was Flash and some related ones. So Flash replaced applets, uh, basically more graphically advanced. So some of the ones you might remember, uh, Micromedia Flash Player, that's one. Uh, Apple QuickTime, I remember I had to get that because there were some uh, videos I wanted that were only in uh, QT format. Uh, Microsoft Silverlight, once in a while if I go to an old Microsoft page, I'll still, you know, I'll get an alert that says, hey, we see you're not running Microsoft Silverlight, would you like to install it now? So that was one that they were pushing. I don't think it ever got much traction. Uh, anyway, they use fractional pixels, so the graphics looked a lot better. When I say smoother rendering, the images look better, right? Whatever you're trying to do, it doesn't look all blocky and pixelicious. But still, they had the same basic security problems. The security problems were a plugin, likewise, again, anything you want to do on a website, it's probably going to need legitimate access to the session key so it can verify that it's you at different points of the website. So, because it's legitimate in many ways for these plugins to use that, yeah, it's really hard to, you know, put a blanket thing, say, no, you can't do this. The other problem is it's very difficult for automated security tools to recognize which applications should be able to use it, which shouldn't. So, current status, applets, for all practical purposes, they're gone. I mean, I'm not going to say you couldn't possibly find one somewhere out there on the internet, but uh, the last one I remember uh, having one uh, Chess.com still used one about, I don't know, I'm going to say five, six years ago. I saw they still had one. I don't know about any of the others. Uh, I'm not aware of any other sites that were using them at that time. The other, plugins. So plugin content still exists. For example, when I played Angry Birds on here, it asked me to ac activate uh, Flash Player. So yeah, plugin content is still out there. But most browsers stopped supporting most plugins uh, actually a couple years ago now. A little bit of an outdated sentence there. So plugin content still exists, but it's no longer really a default option. There's a lot of cases where you go onto the ACCC machines or even your own machine and it'll say this site uses Flash Player. Do you want to accept the risks of using it? Okay. So in terms of security, 
So plugin, remember, is a separate application, so it often needs access to information that the browser uses. Now, if it's a legitimate plugin, right, if it's designed by some credible source, whatever, it can probably be trusted, although really you never know. Uh, but if it's a bad plugin, if it's written maliciously, or somebody, some other part of the problem has, you know, uh, somehow messed with it, it can steal information, right? It could have, uh, the plugin itself could be fine, but it might not carefully protect that information from other things uh, that are going on on your machine. So for example, there might be some malware on your machine that constantly tries to access the plugin itself, and anytime the plugin uses the session key, the malware can attack it and try to grab it because maybe the, uh, you know, the plugin isn't protecting it well enough. So things like that can happen. So they can lift passwords, they can lift session tokens, uh, this is a fun one too. Anybody ever remember uh, Mac Flashback? Anybody heard of that? Okay, so I know there's some Mac people in here because I see a lot of apples over the, you know. Uh, okay, remember that Mac people weren't very happy because you couldn't do Flash Player on it for years? Does that ring a bell for anybody? Like you wanted to play Angry Birds and shit and you can't because Mac didn't support uh, Flash Player? So they kind of went back and forth on that and eventually, because Apple said, well, you know what, Flash Player is, you know, uh, all, has all sorts of vulnerabilities and the Flash Player people said, well, yeah, that's true, but you guys are just dickheads who want to design all your own custom apps and not give Flash Player any money. And Apple said, well, that's true, but, you know. Uh, so anyway, they went back and forth with that for a couple years and eventually Apple kind of caved and said, well, we're going to let our users, if they really, really want to, we're going to let them run Flash Player. And then Flash Player stopped kind of developing stuff for Apple like about a year after that. So it was a really weird situation. Anyway, coming to the point here, around 2011 or so, there was a large and frustrated group of people who really wanted to get Flash Player on their Macs and they couldn't. So what did the bad guys do? They did this. See if we can get this. Mac Flashback Malware. Okay, and this is from 2012. So... People designed a version of Flash Player, right? Flashback is a form of malware designed to grab passwords and other information through their web browser and other applications such as Skype. Basically, it does Flash Player stuff, except here's the difference. It's malicious. But what they do, they just say, hey, download and install this application. People say, oh, great, now I can do Flash Player on my Mac. But guess what? When they install it, they basically they give away the keys to the castle. They say, yeah, I'm going to install it with the default settings, and the default settings are going to allow Flashback to have access to all these things. And because the user voluntarily installed it, it's going to be treated as a trusted application. So, yeah, basically they made this available, and hundreds of thousands of people at least uh, did it. Where They used to have a number for this. Here's one, yeah, more than 600,000 Macs infected with Flashback botnet. Okay, so that kind of malware got on the machines and did all sorts of crazy stuff. Okay, so that, that's what can happen sometimes. <coughs> now, all complex systems have vulnerabilities, right? Uh, the software these days and computers these days and networks are so complicated that there's always gonna be some gaps. Nobody's gonna catch all the possible problems. But in particular to plugins, uh, many plugins do things that at least some plugins ought to be able to do. So these vulnerabilities are really hard for automated security tools to say, you're a plugin, you shouldn't be able to do that because some of the plugins ought to be able to access the session keys. Basically, so you don't have to re-log into Facebook every time you go to a different page on Facebook, for example. Second thing, plugin developers historically, they weren't super careful about finding and fixing problems. So when I say less rigorous, they were like, well, we were more focused on the, uh, the graphics end of things and we want to design the optim optimal user experience, make stuff look good and run well. But as far as digging around in security, they were like, well, number one, they're not really security guys. And number two, they kind of had the attitude, well, it's not really our problem, right? That's for the antivirus guys to worry about. So yeah. They gave some thought to it, but certainly it was nowhere near their top concern. Uh, last, there was a window between about 2005 and 2010 where, uh, really like 2001 and 2010, there were a lot of different plugins trying to be developed. And so there were a whole bunch of different ones on the market uh, by different developers. Some of them were uh, you know, much worse than others. 
But because there were so many different plugins out there, multiplied the number of ways where things could go wrong. So if you had an idea, if you were a bad guy and you said, well, let's see if this new attack I'm coming up, let's see if it works. Probably not going to work on every plugin, but yeah, it's probably going to catch a, a few of them. So basically the bad guys could design their applications to include a whole bunch of different types of attacks and probably on most plugins would get caught by at least one of them. Okay, we'll talk just a little more and then we'll call it a day, I think. Okay, anybody ever heard of Willie Sutton? No, your grandparents might have. He was a man from the golden age of bank robbery, which in the U.S. was approximately around, I don't know, 1925 to 1935. It was like a big thing. You know, you get your buddies and you get some guns and a fast car, a Model T or something, you go rob some banks. That was a thing to do. Anyway, Willie Sutton, he was a very famous bank robber. When they finally caught him, they asked him, why do you rob banks? You know, the implication being, out of all the things you could choose to do in life, why would you choose to become a bank robber? But he didn't hear the question that way. He heard it as, well, I'm definitely going to steal something because that's just my nature. That's what I do. So the question he heard was, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is, right? Same thing with security. Same idea. The bad guys, mostly they're rational, you know, once they have made the decision to be bad guys. Beyond that, they're rational. They want to make go after the target that brings them the best stuff. So if you're trying to exploit web browser vulnerabilities, what's gonna drive your selection? Well, number one, popularity, right? If it's a popular browser, if it's a popular uh, website object that's you know used on a lot of pages, uh, the website itself is popular, you can target an operating system that's popular, any one of those, if you come up with one attack, you're gonna get a lot more mileage out of it because you can attack a lot more different points in the system. Number two, value of information, okay? So stuff like Facebook passwords or, uh, you know, access to session keys, that has some value. You can use it to send out spam emails or links. Uh, you can use it, you know, for other malicious purposes. Uh, passwords have uh, value too. There was a scam uh, running around a few years ago where uh, one of these malware things would grab your password from a website and it would basically assume, well, a lot of people are lazy and they reuse many passwords across many sites. And so they would tell you, they say, once they got one of your legit passwords, even if they didn't know what site it was from, they could say, ah, we've, you know, we have this password from your account just so that you know we're not playing. And we were seeing, we had somehow tapped into your computer camera and we saw you watching porn or we saw you making movies at home and if you don't give us a thousand dollars in bitcoin we're gonna send your homemade porno to your grandma and anyway i hope nobody in this room fell for that uh anyway so that stuff happens information value yeah there's some value there right maybe you send out like a thousand of those uh blackmail things and like one guy falls for it and sends you a thousand bucks so yeah, you know, there, there's you could you could make money on that a little bit, I guess, but it's nowhere near the amount of money you could get from say hacking a commercial bank, right? The one thing that happened some years ago, something called Eurograbber, uh, basically in a whole system of European banks, they set up a mechanism where anytime somebody logged in to view their bank account balance, they pulled one percent of their bank account balance and transferred it to an offshore account. And by the time all the smoke is clear, had cleared, they got something like $60 million out of it all. So some information, you know, is a little bit valuable. Some information is very valuable. Obviously, you want to target the information that's most valuable. And of course, the timing. Timing meaning the likelihood of an attack being successful. So if an attack is completely new, has never been seen before, nobody has patches for it available, yeah, you're going to get more mileage out of that right away. Okay, but if the patches are already out there, you can still probably catch some people because what often happens is businesses, you know, they have the patches, but they only install them in batches at a, you know, at a time. And so it might be like a week or two from when they get it to when they actually bother installing it. Or a lot of ordinary computer users, yeah, they have the patches, but they've set their, uh, you know, security settings to only install patches when I definitely say so. So you can still get some people, but the longer it goes on, the more likely the kind of trick is, you know, caught up in the antivirus software or people have other preventive me measures to deal with it. So in general, attack value, number of machines, 
times the probability of success times the value per machine. So if you can target more machines, that's more money. If your probability of success is higher, that's more money. If you get more valuable information, right, the average expected cash in per successful attack, that's going to get you more money. So any of those. Anyway, regardless of the actual vulnerability prevalence, right, whatever's going on there, if, uh, for example, suppose there's a thing in Angry Birds that lets people, I don't know, there's some malware you can put in, and it'll mess with just your Angry Birds account if you have one. That's not really very valuable. I mean, what are you going to do with that? So even though it might be a really high vulnerability, who cares, right? Nobody's really going to go after that. Rational attackers, they're going to focus on high value attacks. The big ones, you know, bank account stuff and to a lesser extent, sometimes social media. Okay? Okay. All right, this is a good break point. So we'll come back. We'll talk later.